Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Naomi Lawrence-Reed, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Long time listener, first time caller, big fan. Thanks for having love it, me. Love it, thank you. Um, so let's start off with the differently doctoring origin story, or rather doctoring differently. Right, uh, okay, well, origin story, I am a pediatrician. I uh, did my, I went to medical school in Massachusetts. I did my residency in New York City. I actually really enjoyed residency. Uh, I was in a 10 story children's hospital. It was fun and exciting, big class, lots of good medicine. Uh, and I imagined pediatric emergency medicine to be my future soon after that. I began working in a PZR and applied to pediatric fellowship, pediatric emergency fellowship, did not, uh, what, did not get it, was not accepted or did not match. Uh, but continued to work in a PZR for almost three years and was really unhappy and miserable. Uh, and wait, 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 I'm sorry. You applied for, so by yeah. the way, fellow, non-fellow matching, I uh, applied for a rhinology fellowship. Okay. Just doing noses didn't, didn't match. So okay. same, similar boat. Um, but you said you applied for, and this is just my lack sure. of understanding of peds. You sure. applied for a peds ER fellowship mm -hmm. and then didn't get it, but you still went and worked in a PZR anyway. I was already working. So PZRs are kind of split into higher acuity and lower acuity. Lower acuity maybe being closer to an urgent care type of uh, acuity. So yes, there are parts of, e of pediatric emergency departments that are staffed by general pediatricians if that to answer your question. So the, to work in the higher acuity section were the fellowship trained pediatric emergency medicine people of which at one point I aspired to become. Uh, okay, so maybe you could get experience doing that uh, lower acuity and then get hired in a higher acuity one. So kind of a way to bypass the fellowship. Oh, uh, well, that, I don't know that you can fully bypass it these days, but it was kind of like my introduction to the department. I thought maybe a, um, uh, like yes. an audition almost. If exactly. That makes yeah. Sense. You start working there and they're like, you know what, why don't you do a fellowship here? Yeah. Oh, great. You know, I never thought of that. I'd love to. Yeah. That part. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so I, I, that is exactly what happened. I, I was working there and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, they hired me as a, as an attending to, uh, to, you know, be the attending on record and see tens you to, to a lot of, a lot of children daily, they must, uh, trust me enough to hire me as a fellow. Uh, and they did not, or bring me on as a fellow. So I did not, uh, match in that fellowship. Uh, and this was now 2015. So I finished my residency in 2014. Um, but I continued to work in the PZR. I, at that time, did not really want to do outpatient. Uh, I, I didn't have a great next plan other than continuing to work in the PZR. Uh, however, PZR is uh, here. Um, it's, it's in an ER. 
that's, I don't have a cute joke. It's in an emergency department. And that means it's open 24 hours a day and uh, you're working nights and weekends and holidays. And I was exhausted and being kind of the lower acuity part of the ER as a pediatrician, I'm looking in ears at three in the morning. And in my mind, I'm thinking this is not, this will not be my career. Um, and as I tried to do some sort of soul searching and kind of listening and looking around my community, I live in San Diego. Uh, I, you know, people just told me really your only options are another fellowship or working in an outpatient setting. And I just thought, you know, at the time, not married, no children, I thought, you know, I have a lot of flexibility in my life. I can do anything. I can go anywhere. I'm going to take my chances and do that. Um, so I, you know, the short answer, there's a whole lot in there, some great stories I could tell about kind of what got me to that place. Uh, but ultimately, I left in May of 2017 and started exploring just out of curiosity, first out of survival. I went per diem at another institution. I had to pay bills. No one was there to pay them but me. Um, so I, I had to have that bridge of just per diem income to pay loans and living expenses. But then that snowballed into discovering that any physician can do aesthetics, discovering that um, I could do locums, I could do veteran disability work, I could do medical expert witness work, I could do telemedicine. So now I'm almost five years from that point where I left the PZR, and I have now explored hmm, seven or eight different types of work for physicians, and it has been truly incredible. So I think that answered maybe your question, just trying to gloss over a lot of the little details about the origin story. It was initially out of survival. Um, it morphed into curiosity. And now it is truly just a fun, lucrative ride. So I, I just want to point out something to the listeners that we often mention on the podcast, which is hedonic adaptation, right? Like you get used to anything. So now I'm over 10 years out from my residency and things do get monotonous. You know, it's, you know, I'm seeing a lot of ear infections. I'm seeing a lot of sinus infections. I'm seeing a lot of, right. And so, yeah, each patient tells a story and everyone's an individual fine, but there is some monotony there. And when you have seven or eight different income streams and you might be like, you know what, I don't necessarily, I'm not in love with this one. So, you know, we're going to do this one, which might lead to another one, which leads to another one. And so you're constantly learning. It's constantly something new. Um, and so that then you don't have that hedonic adaptation. And one thing that everyone always tells me with kids is, oh, it goes so fast. Right. And, and so the way that you, the, that's not advice. That's just like, thanks. <laughs> No, not helpful. But the way that you combat that is by slowing time down is by paying attention and being present. So how do you be present during, you know, something monotonous? You're not present during your commute to work, but when you're doing as many things as you're doing, you have to, you're paying attention and it slows down time in a good way. It, well, unless you really hate what you're doing, and then you don't have to do it because you've got seven other income streams. Exactly that. Exactly that. I have come again, and I just want to tell your listeners and you, I certainly was not, I, this was in no way my future. If you had asked me in medical school what my goal was, it was going to be a community pediatrician. I was going to bring cupcakes to clinic or to the hospital every Friday, not cause any problems, just do my job, you know, see, do my thing. Um, so this is, something I truly have uh, evolved into. And initially, I think out of survival, I keep using that word in that, you know, I feel, you know, people have told me, physicians have told me what I've done is quote unquote brave. They, oh, you left your job. You're exploring so, so many things. That's so brave. And I tell them, I've never felt brave a day in my life. I felt like my hand was on a hot stove and I pulled it off. That's what it felt like to me. It didn't feel like a, a, a courageous act of, of valor or or bravery it felt like i am unhappy i don't see a path upward or forward here as a pediatrician in a pzr you're a stepchild you know this is a fellowship based you know world and as a just a pediatrician quote unquote unquote uh you don't have really much room to ascend in administrative roles or teaching roles or anything else um and being in academics maybe you've discussed that you're you're the, academics is essentially latin for underpaid so uh, <laughs> and then you put pediatrician in there and uh again as your listeners may know pediatricians underpaid least paid of all specialties um and so i i just came to the realization that 
none of this was going to work for me. I didn't, at the time I maybe had some regrets about going into pediatrics, but thinking back, I can't imagine doing another specialty. It just was, I need to just figure out how to do it differently. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of differently, you are <laughs> doctoring differently I and am. here at the physician's guide to doctoring. We <laughs> use doctor also as a verb. So yes. how did you end up deciding to use it as a verb? <laughs> well, uh, I'll, 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 I think bring them, maybe the mood somber it just a little bit. Um, my mother, uh, who passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, oh, she used sorry. to say to me, thanks. She used to say to me, you know, she was eternally proud um, and got to see me graduate med school and residency. And she used to say, I wish I could watch you doctoring. I wish I could see you doctoring. Um, of course, she never did because I would have been weird. But that those were that was a word uh, to her and then to me because she said it to me so often. Uh, so, you know, a few years ago, and I guess I'll, I'll kind of get into more of the story of how this my platform evolved. But after I'd spent a few months really kind of going back and forth about kind of what my voice would be, what my platform would be. Uh, I thought I needed a name. I needed a punchy name that said it all in, in the name, in the title. And uh, I was just sitting on my couch and it, it, it came to me. It, and, you know, it had been almost oh, about two years since she passed at that point. We were deep in the pandemic. It was like, you know, bleak days out here. But when that kind of hit me, I thought that's, that's it. Doctoring differently. It's every, it, it says it all, you know, you're still a doctor. You're still performing and acting and serving as a physician. You're just doing it in a different way, not a better way, not a worse way necessarily. I'm partial. I think it is a far better way, but at the end of the day, it's a different way. It's an alternative uh, that most of us were not exposed to in at any part of our training. No, that's a really sweet story. I love that. I love that. Um, so, so what are these different, differently streams that you're getting? If we could just, sure. you know, go through the go through. different ones in, in, in list form, and then we'll sure. explore some of them. Sure. Uh, I'll kind of, I'll, I think of them in the order in which I explored them. So it started with per diem work, then locums, then aesthetics, Botox fillers, then, uh, telemedicine then uh, ve uh, veteran disability work, medical expert witness work, social security work. I think that's it. I don't know, six, seven, I think. I wasn't counting, sorry, okay. but yes. No problem. Sounds about right, okay. Okay, fair. Um, social security work, that's a new one for me. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. What uh, is that? Sure, so there are, well, break it down, there are a number of federal programs that require physicians to kind of determine how money is allocated to patients. Uh, Social Security provides uh, benefits, uh, provides financing for children, well, I'm a pediatrician, this is pediatric work, uh, but let's say children who are, um, who have a disability, or are in foster care. There are a number of federal programs that uh, these children are eligible to apply for, or maybe a child has a chronic illness, the family earns too much to necessarily apply for say Medicaid, they are uh, eligible to apply for other federal, federally based services, if that makes sense, to, um, to kind of supplement, you know, yes, we make a little bit too much, but no, we also cannot afford a half a million dollars a year in medical bills, that kind of thing. So there are some nuance here. There's some nuance in terms of these federal programs. Uh, and again, so, so my role uh, when I do the social security adjudication work uh, is I am a medical expert and I can be called upon for either a chart review where I get a, a, a plaintiff's or a claimant claimants records ahead of time, um, and then come to a decision and say, you know what, based on this criteria, this child has severe ADHD or severe autism. And I, and based on my expert opinion, uh, this child should be eligible for additional services or compensation. Um, and so that is how social security works. That's kind of interesting. If there's like a judge on the phone and with COVID, it's actually been really nice to be able to do it virtually because it's, oh, this is an important part for you and your listeners. This is federal work. So there's no specific medical license involved. Uh, so I, you, 
you don't need, I don't, I've adjudicated cases from New Jersey, Massachusetts. I live in California. I only have a California medical license. It doesn't matter. Um, when you're doing federal work, you can do it to any state uh, without having to go get that license. So that's- And I know what the listeners are thinking and let me know if you're not comfortable ask, answering. Sure. What's the pay for something like that? Oh, sure. So per case, uh, the rate I've negotiated, I'm a big, big, big fan of negotiation, by the way, I do not accept any first offers for almost any of the work I do. Um, I, I am paid, I think $220 per case. Uh, and these cases last on the phone roughly 30 minutes, uh, but I'll do about 30 minutes of prep work reviewing the chart ahead of time. So yeah, okay. I, I, based on the rate, I'll tell you that I, and I was clear with the agency I worked with, uh, that $220 uh, buys them basically an hour of my time. I, I'm yeah. very clear about that. Uh, yeah, so I sense. said, you know, if you, if you're expecting a full day review and like combing through hundreds of charts, you're not going to get that at this rate. Uh, and they uh, understood it. And yep. we have proceeded. I've, I've, we proceeded as such. How'd you get in touch with them? Uh, so that backs up to the veteran, uh, veteran disability work I do. Um, and so there are, when I talk, right. I'll just kind of. That's interesting because the pediatrician, right? Like I know we send children off to war, right? They're like 18, 19. They're kind that. of, yes. They're, yes. you know, but, but. Right. Like when I think of the VA, I think of like the Vietnam and the World War II, Korean War vets that I took care of when I rotated through as a, as a resident. So like, how does a pediatrician fit in there? Great question. Uh, all right. Well, this is, brings me to eventually how I got it. It was a it was the VA then to the Social Security, but again, federal. Um, I connected again in the pin when I started having the idea for doctoring differently. I'd only I was only up to like four different um, streams, and I reconnected with a friend here in San Diego, a family medicine physician. Found her on LinkedIn. And I was seeing all this veteran work. And last I knew, she was still a practicing family physician at a, at a local large hospital system. So I called her up and I said, you know, what's going on? What's all this veteran stuff? And it's, uh, you know, is this something I could potentially teach my future students and clients about? I in no way was, as you just said, imagining a pediatrician could do VA work or veteran disability work. Um, she was so passionate about this kind of stream that she had found her own, own husband was a Marine veteran. And uh, at that point, she uh, illuminated or, or taught me uh, that, again, this is a federal, a federal um, uh, ruling um, by Congress that any physician of any specialty also PAs, nurse practitioners, advanced practice practitioners can also perform this veteran disability work. Um, and it does not matter the specialty at all. Uh, and now that I've done this work for over a year, uh, I can confirm that it is a lot of just third and fourth year medical school knowledge. These are not diagnostic exams. These are not clinical exams. I am not ordering tests. I'm not treating anything. I am basically a veteran will claim as they dissociate from the military or separate, uh, they will claim, you know, a number of ailments or illnesses. Um, they will come to their visit with me. I have their entire medical record in their hand. I get their, uh, their, you know, personal, uh, their, their history. Uh, I may do a brief physical exam. That's almost always just musculoskeletal. Um, maybe it's, a, if there's a scar, the VA likes us to measure scars. Um, but that is really the end of it. I'm not ordering again, not ordering tests, not treating, not diagnosing. Um, and I compile a report based on what's in the chart, what they've told me and the physical exam. Um, so it was initially, you know, it, I was about 10 years out of medical school. So 10 years since I'd treated an adult patient and it was initially a little like, oh, okay, okay. You know what? I can do this. I've done this before. I can do this again. And it's been lovely. It really has been wonderful. Uh, I've refreshed myself on the Korean War and the time frame and Agent Orange. And it's I'm kind of a little bit of a history buff, so I've enjoyed that part. And so again, these veterans are not sick. This is not a clinical visit. So a lot of them just like to talk and are happy to talk uh, to someone about their experiences in 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 not, not all of them have been in combat, but at least during their active duty service. So it's been wonderful. 
the, but to answer your original question, the company, the large, large contractor that facilitates these VA exams um, also has a contract to facilitate Social Security and other federal um, programs that require physician, uh, physician expertise. Who is that? <laughs> it's called Maximus. Maximus. So they, Maximus. this company has like a billion dollar contract. You need to, the, vet, the Department of Veteran Affairs has like something like a 48 annual billion dollar budget. Just know that there's a lot of money in the VA and all of this work. So uh, yeah, yeah, they have these contracts to facilitate these exams, onboard physicians, create the infrastructure, create the EMR. And uh, yeah, and and so they, not only do they have, you know, one arm is the veteran world, but these other arms are social security, are, um, uh, they, there's, a, there's a number, there's a number of different, of different things. So it's been, it's been a fun journey. So I was in with one, and I just slid over and got in with some others. So with the the VA, you're just recording an exam, a history and exam. You're not deciding anything. Whereas no. with Social Security, yes. you are actually making a decision on what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. No, just actually, no, it's it's very similar. I give my uh I give my expert opinion. Uh, and then a for Social Security, a judge actually decides uh, a, a judicial, I'm sorry, a uh, yes, a judicial, you know, a, a local judge or local kind of circuit judge makes the decision. He asks me questions, he or she asks me questions. I give my opinion and then I don't actually know the decision they make. They make it after, you know, I've gotten off the phone with them. Um, and same with the VA, I'll say, I'll make, you know, I'll put my report together, it goes to the VA, the VA makes a decision, I don't hear what the decision was. So, you know, I know that a lot of physicians think, you know, and, and I could say the same about medical expert witness work, if we get there, uh, you know, physicians, we have this, uh, I don't want to say godlike mentality, but we think that a lot of this work is, you know, all, uh, all the control and all the powers in our hands. And, you know, it's a lot of pressure. And with so much of this work, you're just giving your opinion. You're just giving your expert opinion. That's what people want from us. Uh, and they'll pay us a lot of money to do it. We'll get, again, medical expert witness work. We'll get to that. Um, they'll pay you a lot of money for your opinion. And then someone else makes the decision. So there should be a little less pressure off of, off of you for that. So which of all of your non-clinical, because yeah. we're going to get to the Botox and fillers, but of, of all of your non-clinical sure. income streams, which one was the easiest to break into? Easiest, easiest to break into, huh? Um, that's that I wasn't expecting that question. That wasn't in your prompts ahead of time. It was, <laughs> it was the easiest to bring into. I will say for me, I kind of roll with the punches. So I'm often not even looking for new things. I just kind of trickle into them. So it's hard to say if it was easy or not. I mean, my first one I'll say was per diem work. And I know that's not like a sexy one, but really it was just another hospital system in town who needed per diem coverage. And I applied, I mean, yes, I interviewed, but I was immediately accepted. Um, locums work, I can tell you, probably you and almost every physician in the country, we are getting emails and calls and texts about locums work. There's just no way, there's no way to get off those lists. I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> but <laughs> if you wanted to do it, you could very yeah. easily, right? So it's just like a matter of what you really want. Um, aesthetics, I'm kind of going down the list in terms, I, I'm giving you a, a kind of rundown on, on all of them. Aesthetics, I will say, requires an initial investment of, of money and time in terms of taking classes and doing some, doing training and then buying product. So I'd say, I mean, you could easily quote unquote break into it. You just have to sign up if that makes sense. It's not hard to quote unquote break into, um, but it does require an initial, you know, financial and time investment. Um, medical expert witness work, I listed myself on a directory and I, you know, over the course of maybe six months, I've been asked to join three cases. So again, they kind of came to me to ask, um, but I just listed myself on just one directory. So which, which one? Uh, Seek, S-E-A-K. I don't know if you get okay. those. And does that one cost money? So that one does. So it costs it, it cost uh, $600 to list yourself. And that was the, I picked the lowest, most inexpensive kind of bracket for listing. Yeah. Um, you can, of course, the higher tiers and you'll be the first, you'll be the number one search and those cost more. Um, 
but the seek one, yes, $600. However, if you don't get any work in one year, get your money back. Oh, but I've gotten three. Wow. Yeah. See, so it's almost like, why not? Well, if you don't take any work or if you don't get offered any work, that's a great question. I don't know. I was, gotcha. I, okay. I've, ta I've taken, I've yeah. taken, I've taken three. I've taken three. I've turned yeah. down a couple. Um, but I have taken, I've joined three. So yeah. Okay. I can't, I will never know. I'll never know, but it was well worth the $600 investment. So you, you said about the, or let me rephrase that. You live in San Diego and you do Botox and fillers. So that to me, I, I would think like if yeah. you were in the middle of Wyoming, mm. right. With, with no, where you could keep the Botox outside because it's so <laughs> cold, right. Yeah. With no cosmetic practice for miles mm. around, I mm. could see that being an easy thing, but you're mm. a pediatrician in San Diego and somehow mm -hmm. are managing to do fillers. Like I live in, I live in you know, New York city suburb. Okay. And so there are tons of cosmetic surgeons. There's the oh. battle between general plastics and facial plastics and then oral surgeons and oculoplastic surgeons and all of these, everyone's done a fellowship or two fellowships or three, oh, right. Lord. So like, how, okay. 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 What, okay. Let me, <laughs> let me see. All right. I've got, I've got plenty to say about this. So I'll tell you how I started. A friend of mine, uh, her father is, a, was a retired vascular surgeon in Iowa. Uh, not even Des Moines, like some other, I've never been to Iowa, but some, some other part of Iowa. He was a vascular surgeon who, uh, after, you know, nearly 30 years of private practice, vascular surgery, you know, was approached by his front desk ladies, receptionists who said, Hey, would you, you know, maybe consider, you know, doing, you know, physicians have to own these practices. So could you incorporate this somehow? Um, so, and he, he, his own words were, I'm a crusty white guy. Why would anyone come to me for any of that? Those were his words, um, but he was a very good businessman. So he, you know, looked into it. He already had he being vascular, doing vein work. He already had lasers. A lot of med spas, you know, do laser work. Um, and he got a practice up and running in, a, in I think, six to eight months, um, kind of hired some estheticians and other people to come in, got some training himself and added it to his vascular practice. Uh, right. He turned That's around. Iowa. Huh? That's Iowa. That's Iowa. That's Iowa. That's okay, Iowa. I'm getting here. I'm getting there. So he then turns around, sells the practice to an interventional cardiologist. Apparently, the he he said the the margins on the aesthetics work work uh, the aesthetics arm of the practice were so big that is what sealed the deal. Not the like cabbage, you know, vascular actually saving lives part. It was the aesthetics part that that like got him got got the sale, got the got the deal. So he tells me, he's like, "Okay, he's he says, I killed in, you know, in 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 suburban rural Iowa." This is Southern California. This is San Diego. You know, he said, you know, at the time I was younger, but he said, you're young, you know, you're a physician. That is all people care about. And any physician can do it. He was telling me and a number of us young, you know, friends of his daughters who are all young physicians. And so we started thinking, you know, I was unhappy in my pediatric ER life at the time. And I just was like, huh, I never considered it. I grew up in Boston we don't do that. You know, we're not, we're not, but yeah, we're not, we don't do that. That's not the culture I'll say. Um, and I just, I probably sat on it for like a year, kind of looked into things, was looking at other practices in San Diego, other med spas. And let me tell you, most of the med spas are owned by, uh, let's see, family medicine, OB, uh, um, uh, emergency Emergent former emergency physicians, anesthesiologists, a lot of medical spas are actually not owned by, or operated by the derm, the plastics, the all of that. And and let me just say, so so I started taking ENT. classes. Don't forget ENT. Sorry, ENT. I we will never. should be, you know, up in I, that. Yeah, I, and I will say one of the. So I started taking courses, uh, which you can sign up for, which you can get CME for. And by the way, when I took a lot of these classes that were part didactic, part hands on, I was one of the few physicians in any of the classes. They're all nurses, so you may go to an oculoplastic whomever, whomever eight fellowships later. It's still probably going to be a nurse who's doing your Botox. Uh, so, so just know that it's it's 
I was, I am almost always the minority, uh, the physician minority in any of these hands-on classes I've ever taken for this, um, because it is so much, so many nurses, nurse practitioners, um, PAs, that's who does the injecting period. That's who operates the lasers. So these practices have to be owned by, again, a physician of any specialty, but your actual injectors, they cannot, they have to be at least, at least a nurse. Sorry. I do say at least a nurse. They can't be estheticians or in others. Actually in California, they have to be nurses. I do believe it is state by state. So in some states, it does not have to be a medical professional. I think Arizona is one where it could be like, you know, an esthetician who, you know, does your eyebrows and then does your Botox. I don't think that's the safest, but you know, I, I get that question a lot. Pediatricians, let me tell you, as, as a very pro pediatrician person, uh, I, will, I will tell you that I think pediatricians are people's favorite doctors and the most trustworthy. You, if I'm outside of medicine, outside of the hierarchy of medicine where you know pediatricians are you know the cute little people with the kids in the corner, you know, you say it to a room of non-medical people, people like pediatricians. We are trustworthy. People generally have good memories of their own. They take their kids to them. It's, it, they trust us inherently. Uh, and so, when you're doing Botox, you can take out a picture of a couple of babies that's and it. be like, you want to look young? That's right. This that's was it. my last client. This was my last patient. I Here lean is, into baby. <laughs> this is how young you're going to look. <laughs> exactly. And I lean into it. I mean, I kind of say, you know, oh, I, I have a rep to protect. I use the tiniest needles. I do. I use 32 gauge. Um, and so I, I lean into it with almost everything I do. I never, you know, I see veterans and some, they have my name ahead of time. And sometimes they'll say, I Googled you. I see you're a pediatrician. And I look at them in the face and I say, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, we stare down and then we keep going. Um, but yes, I am. Now let's check your prostate. That's right. That's right. Usually it's like the spouse who's Googled me. Never, yeah. never, rarely yeah. the vet himself. Uh, but, but, but all that to say for, 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 uh, aesthetics in Southern California, people just care that you're a doctor. And, and by the way, by the way, my clientele has almost all, I don't have a brick and mortar. I pretty much do it. You know, when I started, when I started this almost, oh my gosh, four years ago, I started doing this. That was the thought that I was going to have a brick and mortar. I was going to have my own med spa and staff and yada, yada. And it was a, a pandemic, I think, decision for me that I was like, that I, I really reflected that this is not my passion. I do not want to be a, a med spa. I don't, I don't want that. And doctoring differently is where I truly love. And I feel like that is my truck? zone of genius. What was that? What about instead of a med spa brick and mortar? How about a food truck? Oh, you know, right? people like have a med said spa that to me. Like truck. An, people have said that to me, like an ice cream truck that like, you know, like it has the music and it goes down the block <laughs> exactly. and all the moms come out. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, oh, she's here. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard that. I certainly have. And it is not a terrible idea. There are mobile tanning beds and mobile IV hydration, as you know. So oh, there's a lot yeah. of all that. Um, so, you know, I'm sure someone's doing it. I don't know that that will be my future either, but uh, it has been just- Panini I Press, Botox. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've enjoyed the way I do it. Parties, one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I can, you know, how to start it. I know how to do it if I wanted to. I actually have some nurses who are, I'm medical directors for their own practices uh, in Southern California. But for me personally, I don't really want a brick and mortar. Now that I've discovered, you know, now that I'm really in, in my doctoring differently mode, I want to, to tell doctors and advocate for physicians and teach how to start all of the things that I do. So I think that well, it seems like with the brick and mortar, there's going to be a lot of overhead. Sure. And then exactly. you're, exactly. and then you're tied to it, right? Then you've got an anchor That's as opposed exactly to everything right. that you're doing right now. Right. You have nothing but freedom, nothing but freedom. And let me tell you, it is <laughs> the best thing ever. I cannot even tell you. I mean, I'm grateful every day that I discovered this way to work, you know, trusted myself. I'll say, I, I won't give you brave, but I will give, I trusted myself. And it has been truly incredible. Um, but it was watching my friends and colleagues and classmates, you know, in uh, two years ago, you know, deep in 2020, just struggle and not know about any options and think clinical medicine was all they could ever do. It was that, that really just, I was like, I have to, I have to create something to teach you know, to disseminate this information um, as effectively as possible. It's hard to tell though, from the way you're talking about it, you don't seem passionate about this material at all. It's not just like <laughs> bursting out of your pores. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so so if you have 
some parting words for our audience about um, anything that you wanted to talk about today, mm. but didn't get a chance to touch on any of Let's your see. income streams that you wanted to elaborate on a little, maybe get, didn't get the chance. I think we covered, I think we covered a lot. But we did. We did. We co we covered it. I think, you know, and that's why I offer, you know, what I do. I kind of teach it as as I don't kind of. I do teach it as a 6-week course. And I start the beginning because yes, it's so people will try to ask me, you know, questions, snippets and sometimes it pans out for them and sometimes it doesn't about, you know, maybe pursuing a different avenue stream. Um I First of all, love what you're doing. Please teach the medical students, teach the residents. Like this is my this is my uh, mantra too. But for the most part, I tell them come back at the end of residency. I don't have much for med students, but everyone, of course, is relatively unhappy and looking for some light uh, and some freedom and some some uh, money generating some some lucrative income streams. Uh, but what I will say is, you know, my, my main mantra that I say throughout my course is, you know, first of all, there are no rules to doctoring in medical school in residency, we're taught one way to be a doctor, that's full time clinical almost always, you know, we're not taught about the alternative ways to practice, especially the ways that can be lucrative, that can and um, allow us to have flexibility of schedule, flexibility to be with our family. We're not taught those. Um, and so, you know, I think physicians have, you know, our personalities, right? We don't like risk. We didn't sign up to be entrepreneurs. We kind of wanted a very straight path with not a whole lot of variation in it. And, and so by the time we get out of training in our thirties, you know, we're not, you know, kids come the house, the mortgage the bills, the real adulting life comes and we don't feel like this is our time or that we've ever been given permission to explore potentially creative avenues to make money, to do things that interest us even with outside of medicine. So I, my my main my main mantra is number one there are no rules to doctoring and two you have permission you know I like to say if no one's ever giving you permission I give you permission I like I like to say doctors don't need permission but we do we need someone to say hey it's okay you know you're you're not you're no less of a doctor if you don't have a full time clinical contract no one can ever take your education your experience your expertise away no one ever can um, and so the thought that once you leave academics or once you leave full time clinical medicine you can never ever ever go back um, is a lie. Um, so that's how it, <laughs> that's, yeah, I feel like we all graduate with this, like relationship with our department chairman that they're like your parent and they're judging, you, you know, they're, they're looking at your career and they're judging you. And if you're not in academia and doing research and contributing in those ways, those traditional ways, then they're like, you're a disappointment and I never should have let you in this program, but there are other ways to, there are other ways to doctor. I love it. I love it. So many ways, so many ways. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, I thank you for what you're doing. I, I have visions of, of, of creating hopefully like a money in business, teaching residents, teaching, um, um, uh, medical students about how money is made in medicine. Of course, I feel like that is very intentionally not taught to us. Uh, but physicians, this whole system rests on our, on our, um, labor and we are, we don't see profit margins often in many specialties. And, uh, I think that that, you know, there are just so many, there are just so many parts of this that, uh, I would, I could expand on all day, but at the end of the day, I like to, I say, I give, physicians permission to explore anything at all that interests them and no decision is final. And you said you use the word leverage. And I, I love that because as you're exploring these other income streams, you're less reliant on the large hospital system, uh, academic center employment, Absolutely. which means if they want you, Absolutely. well, now you have leverage. Right. And if enough of us, of us have these alternate income streams, well, now we hold the cards and they no longer hold the cards. And if they want us, then they're going to need to pay for it. Right. Okay. They're going to need to in treating us well, fixing the EMR so it's not so awful. So our lives are easier and we can doctor better and maybe the malpractice system. And my hopes are really high about all this. And maybe the aspirations are too big. But this is where we start. You just said everything I say on a near daily basis. That's it. That is exactly it. When enough of us, a, a critical mass, a critical volume of us 
do the exactly that. Know our options outside of full-time clinical medicine. I do believe that we as a body of physicians across specialties have the leverage. That's it. So people say, you know, no, 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 Dr. Lawrence Reed, not every doctor can go do Botox. No, that's not what I want. I want doctors to know they can if they want to, but ultimately I want doctors who want to be full-time clinical pediatricians, cardiologists, OBGYNs. I want them to be able to be, to work full-time if they want to, but to be protected, to to have efficient EMR, to have, you know, full six months maternity leave, to have all of the things that, you know, I think that quite frankly, I think short of an actual physician's union, which I'm a huge proponent of, and I don't think my visions are too big. I think we can make it happen in our lifetimes. Um, I think that that will be it. And, and we will, you know, I'll say, I'll say we will regain the leverage. It was lost in the nineties or in and around there, but I do think that we're smart enough. I remind doctors how smart they are all the time. And, and by the way, you mentioned um, being uh, less reliant or not reliant on any major hospital system. I am not um, because I've also figured out how to get my own health insurance and how what to do about my retirement and how to get my own malpractice. All things we can do, but we were never taught to do. Um, and I remind physicians again, Entrepreneurs across the country do it every day. Some with just high school diplomas. You know, how smart are you? I remind, I'm like, I say, remember when you graduated and you had all the regalia because you were a summa cum laude magna? You know, I, right? Remember that? You're capable of learning new things. That is our greatest asset as physicians, is that we can learn new things. Uh, and that's where I come in. I teach many of them. So, where do we begin? Where do we begin? Doctoring differently dot com. That's it. With Dr. Naomi Lawrence Reed. That's yeah. where you begin. <laughs> That's it. Fantastic. This was wonderful. And uh, you kind of referenced this. I'm going to be teaching my medical students some of this material when I come to lecture them in three days, we're going to be including a lot of that. But for the, for the audience out there, doctoringdifferently.com, and you can, you're offering a course, right? As you said, yes. there's a six week course yes. and follow her on Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find all those links in doctoringdifferently.com. That's right. And uh, weekly webinars are going to start uh, at some point in the next month or two. So hopefully in June, I'm, I'm going to start doing weekly webinars and really just trying to disseminate the message that thank you, Dr. Block, you also echoed uh, throughout our whole conversation. Thanks for spreading the good word. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.